Hello and welcome. I'm Michael Pierce and this is The Human Condition. Today we're talking about SNPs and mutations. It turns out that humans can inherit mutations from either parent and we can test for this by testing a swab of your mouth or by testing blood. Now certainly the blood is more accurate Many people do things like 23andMe or other, other types of, of um, companies out there that charge anywhere from $200 and up to assess your genes and give you a, a list of all your, of your genes. If you do a gene test, they will give you a report that may have to do with your family of origin and what country you come from or what countries or what areas. It may have to do with traits like whether you have restless legs or whether you are a super taster or you can smell things or whether your urine produces smells from when you eat foods like asparagus and all that stuff is fun, but it's not really very useful to doctors. What's useful to doctors and to patients is to get their RS numbers. Now, an RS number is the number that's listed on these uh, hundreds of pages that list all these different SNPs. And a SNP is just a spot on the ladder of your gene. If you can imagine that your gene is a, a ladder that twists in space, you've probably seen the pictures of DNA. If it's like a ladder that twists, and everywhere that the rung of the ladder hits the sidebar is a nucleotide, and a nucleotide is just a molecule, and that molecule can be misplaced, it can be wrong. And if it's, if it's made wrong by an inherited error from your mother or your father, you can have either one error and the other one normal, or one error and the other one normal, or you can have both normal, or you can have both an error. So there are really four possibilities, but we call them three because if you have one error, we don't know whether it came from your father or your mother. We just know that you have an error from one parent and not an error from the other parent. We don't know which one. So when you look at your color-coded SNPs, you're going to see that there are some that are green, which are the normal ones. They're uh, no mutation. They're inherited the typical way that, that a gene would be inherited, or, or rather I should say a SNP. A single nucleotide is not a gene. It takes a bunch of nucleotides to make a gene because a gene is like a word and a, uh, a nucleotide is a single letter. So genes are a little different than uh, what a nucleotide is. So when you get a, a gene test for diseases, that's a different thing medically than a SNP test for mutations. So SNPs are not considered diseases, they're considered trends or tendencies. And a, a gene test that, that tests for having the gene for a known disease is a much more complete test that's much more medically accepted. It doesn't invalidate the use of SNPs, it just says that they're not fully vetted by the, by the system. And in, in fact, they're not fully validated, but they're not invalidated. So when you look at the colors, there's a green color that shows that the person has, for that gene, that RS number, n normal or typical. Then there's a yellow color that's often used, and pre pretty standard, and that means you have one mutation. The next one would be the, were for that particular nucleotide pair that rung across the ladder of DNA you inherited two mutations, one from each parent, that would be slightly worse, typically. Now, I don't want people to be scared by, by looking at their gene report and seeing a bunch of red and saying, oh, I'm, this is terrible, because genes are not necessarily turned on at birth. Genes can be, uh, genes and SNPs may be turned off at birth and they may turn on later. So if you've inherited a bad SNP or a bad gene of any kind, they may not be triggered unless you get exposed to toxins, to chemicals, to poisons to deficiencies of nutrients, to high levels of stress, or even trauma and impact can set off genes. We talked earlier about the dystonia gene and how the dystonia gene can be turned on or triggered by a trauma. Literally a head trauma triggers the gene to turn on for dystonia and a person begins to have that contracture. So for our purposes, normal is green and that just means that that SNP that codes for the production of a certain protein would be fairly strong. And the ones that are yellow or red means that there's a mutation. Now, the mutation is stronger if it's a double mutation than if it's a single mutation. So if it's, if it's just one of the pair, it's, it's less strong, we would think, but we don't know how it's expressed. Remember, you need to think of the expression of a gene as, as, a, as a, a dial on a, on a volume control for your stereo. If you turn up the volume control or you push up the slider like this, you get louder expression of sound. And if you turn it down, you get less expression of sound. So genes can be turned up and down by your poisons, by your toxins, by your, your stress level, by your sleep level, and by your, your nutrient level to make sure that you have enough nutrients. So an individual that has a, a SNP shouldn't necessarily be scared by the SNP 
they should simply know that that SNP has a tendency to be more or less mutated or more or less strong. The interesting thing and the confusing thing about SNPs is some of them code for more activity of the enzyme that they're named for, and some code for less activity of the enzyme that they're named for. So you really have to study on places like Snipedia, which is like Wikipedia, but cooler. And it allows a person to look up all these different RS numbers and figure out what's known about them. And for a number of them, there isn't anything known. And for a number of them, there are lots of things that are known, and there's lots of potential for us to do our work. Now, my biggest pet peeve about SNPs and the people that work with SNPs is that sometimes they do one SNP. The most famous one, of course, is the MTHFR SNP, and they do that one SNP on a blood test, and they make decisions about your whole life and your supplements based on one little thing. Now, I don't like that hyper-focus. I think that's not a smart idea. I think they need to expand their focus and, and look at the human from 30,000 feet and consider that all of the different genes with methylation have something to do with each other. and an individual that has a few SNPs, more than one or two, and maybe they're not that bad. Maybe none of them are red. Maybe they're just yellow. Maybe they're uh, only one mutation and not two mutations. If you were to look at a biochemical chart of methylation and of these different pathways that we're dealing with for the individual that have to do with mental health, that have to do with neurotransmitters, that have to do with detoxification of sex hormones, the patient may discover that much like the map of a city, they've got areas that were taken out of the city, areas of, that were taken out of their genes. And so if you look at this biochemical pathway, much like the map of a city, it's almost as though someone had strategically bombed their city and taken out strategic parts of that city. And so in that way, with very little ordinance, someone could take out a, a city and make it very, uh, not very productive in, in wartime. And so that analogy for, um, for SNPs is, is also true. A person, when you, when you back up and look at their whole picture of SNPs, might have a number of SNPs that are not very bad, each, each one, but altogether they add up to a really, really bad combination that might lead a person to depression or anxiety or sulfur intolerance or buildup of uh, stress hormones or buildup of, of toxic uh, chemicals because of a problem with the glutathione pathway. They might have problems with homocysteine. There's a whole number of things that could happen. So Trying to think about SNPs as individual things is just not the way to go, in my opinion. I think we have to look at them as an orchestra working all together, just like the microcosm of a city. When we are addressing SNPs, we want to address the vitamins and minerals that are important for recovering from, from SNP problems. If you decide and, and to do a SNP test and you discover that you've got a number of SNPs that are not so good for you, there are lots of resources that are free and that are under $30 to upload your SNP data and get a report online. And many of them will tell you similar things. They're not all the same, but many of them will tell you similar things that, that say you should up this B vitamin or you should decrease this B vitamin. You should take minerals. You should take lithium. You should take magnesium and, and potassium. You should take zinc. There are a number of advices that are out there regarding taking GABA and GABA support and L-theanine. And these are all very, very useful. So we're just trying to give you a background on how a person might use natural methods to begin looking at their SNPs. Now, we will go through SNPs in greater detail in the future, but right now I just want to get, give you an idea of when you might do that. And the, the general concept would be, if you've exhausted the blood test, the urine test, the saliva tests, the stool tests that are available to your holistic doctor, and you haven't done SNPs, it would probably be a great idea to do SNPs, and it might reveal some answers that you didn't know up until now that have to do with your tendencies of how you might process different vitamins and how you might process different molecules in your brain, especially neurotransmitters and sex hormones and stress hormones and toxins uh, through glutathione pathways. So it's very useful and very helpful to get a picture of your brain. And the cool thing about SNPs is you only have to do them once. Now, realize that because SNPs are a, a measure of your genes, it's possible to have lab error. So if you've done SNPs once, it might be a good idea to do them again with a different laboratory and, and compare the answers to make sure there isn't an error. There could be a lab error or a polluted sample that has some other DNA in there, and you might get different answers. So if you do get a, a different answer on a second SNP test, then you need to do a third and, and figure out what is the tiebreaker because there, it is possible to get different results from different laboratories based on the collection technique or what, was happen, what happened or, or even errors because labs do make errors. By the way, when you do SNPs with things like 23andMe, you're not supposed to make medical decisions. But again, we're not here to make medical decisions. We're here to make lifestyle decisions. We're talking about lifestyle decisions that have to do with balancing 
your body's energy and balancing your body's chemistry in natural ways. We're not talking about diagnosing and treating disease. So that's why I don't have a problem using these tests as a guidance because if you're wrong, you just stop taking the supplement. And if you really need to know your SNPs medically, then you get a medical diagnostic laboratory that will test your genes and your problem is solved. You just have to spend more money.